So, um, all right, I want to start by saying that I think that at its most simple, a trigger warning is a way to admit that abuse happens at universities and in classrooms and between students and between teachers and students. I think that when professors and universities ban these trigger warnings, what they're banning is the mention of their own complicity in violence. So I'm offering a trigger warning today because I'm going to be talking about rape and sexual surveillance and the denial of the claims of rape victims and eugenics. And I'm offering a trigger warning today because universities are places where abuse and patterns and structures of abuse and violence happen. And I admit that I'm speaking and I work at a place that is the product and the cause of trauma and a place where the denial of this abuse and trauma is otherwise mandated. So my talk is entitled Rape, Culture on Campus, on Film, Framing the Failures of Higher Education. In a current project, I've been looking at representations of disability in popular film, popular film that also examines university and college life. In that work, I start with this irony. Disability is underrepresented and suppressed on campus, but overdetermined in film, and especially in popular films about college life. In today's talk, I'm going to also suggest that rape culture is downplayed, actively ignored, disavowed, and suppressed on university campuses, but overdetermined in film. All Hollywood films about college life are, in a way, machines of rape culture. I can't get too deeply or exhaustively into these films, either in number or in depth, today, so I'm going to focus on one specific aspect of the films. And one of the key ways that films about college and university work to reinforce both ableism and rape culture is through fantasies of segregation and isolation. Those who are obviously different from the mainstream of college life are physically removed or at a remove from its social and educational spaces in notable ways. More powerfully, the university is set apart from society and deeply invested in protecting these boundaries. Recogni recognizing how groups are ex excluded from academic life in films, a trope that's so ubiquitous that we might even call it a rule, should show us how readily universities enforce these segregations and erect the walls and boundaries around themselves. In these films, we encounter groups with truly, truly diverse populations, perhaps ironically so. For instance, in old school, uh, characters are assigned names like Spanish to a Latino character and Weensy to a heavyset African American character. In Revenge of the Nerds, there is Te Takashi Toshiro playing the Asian stereotype, Poindexter as a visual impairment, and Lam Lamar Luttrell is an effeminate black student. Takashi dresses up in a full headdress in one segment, segment, ostensibly to cover more bases. The House Bunny offers a fairly uninteresting flip of these gender roles, focusing instead on a sorority as a former Playboy bunny becomes the house mother for a group of seemingly dark and troubled female students after their previous house mother was, quote, hospitalized with hallucinations. One of these students is pregnant. One talks about her trailer park in Idaho. The new house mother just turns these girls into sexual objects as they teach her how to be smart so she can land a man. When she says that the fraternity and sorority houses look, quote, like a bunch of little Playboy mansions, She's perhaps far too close to correct, of course. And the sexualized role of the women is something she successfully reinforces. All female outsiders in these films are rehabilitated only once they can stop being such good students and start becoming sexual objects for male students. Thus, the films reinforce the rape culture or sexual coercion culture on college campuses. And in my work, I use the term rape cu culture carefully. As Jennifer Doyle points out, colleges and universities are run by, quote, communities of men who cannot use the word rape in a conversation because always already there is an agreement not to, to talk like that. But one-fifth to one-quarter of women in North American schools will be victims of rape or attempted rape. In my own research on disability, I found that 83% of disabled women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime, a shocking statistic. A study by Frank Avillo into the experience of deaf and hard of hearing students suggested 48% of these students experienced unwanted sexual contact, at least double the rate of hearing students. In short, rape and sexual assault are themselves a form of disablement on college campuses, and students with disabilities are disproportionately impacted. So I refuse to edit the term rape out or to discuss universities and colleges 
without centering the reality of rape culture. And I strongly assert that these films are artifacts of and promotional materials for this rape culture. This sexual obje objectification in the films is literally a demand, but appropriation into rape culture becomes the key vector of character development for almost all female characters, monumental and real, and a tacit vector of character development for all central male characters who only become real students through sexual conquest. Acculturation into rape culture is part of the development of outsider male characters as well. In Revenge of the Nerds, when the nerds seek revenge for their mistreatment, they stage a panty raid on the Pi Delta Psi house and use the distraction to install video cameras to spy on the women while they undress. As the nerds watch these women naked, manipulating the cameras with remote control, the effect is surprisingly unremarkable, though distressing. This camera view is really no different than the filmic gaze upon women in all of these movies as sexual objects that men go to college to access, discard, trade, or obtain as symbols of status. It's what we see in the social network when Mark Zuckerberg and his friends create the earliest version of Facebook, a panoptical, voyeuristic, and eugenic technology for sorting women based on their sexual desirability. The segregation of nerds and outsiders also has a profoundly eugenic argument to make. Crucially, who partners with whom is a key consideration and an example of eugenics. In the Revenge of, of the Nerds that the Sigma Moos, a misfit sorority with a name that is supposed to describe their undesirability, are partnered with the nerds is an example of this. Combined with the sexualized role of women in all of these films, women who don't seem to go to class and yet do seem to go to parties, there's a perhaps subconscious and yet nonetheless profound eugenic sentiment underlying these, these fantasies of segregation. These films are about eugenic mergers, where specific types of people are matched up with other types enforcing fantasies of race segregation, betterment, and the eradication of difference. Films like The Rules of Attraction, Dear White People, and Spring Breakers paint female students as targets for male professors with varying degrees of agency in this exchange. Other films like The Paper Chase and Back to School are really about masculine competition between professors and students for female love interests. Basically, if a college movie isn't about sports, it's about the sport of chasing women. As already mentioned, this reinforces the rape culture on campuses, but it also highlights a eugenic undercurrent. College is about figuring out, often through violent competition, who should mate with whom. This is what uh, Francis Galton, the father of eugenics, called positive eugenics, something higher education has long held as a key feature, the propagation and mixture of desired groups. In these movies, who partners with who is a key consideration and example of this positive eugenics. Of course, whenever there is promotion of the propagation of desired groups, there is policing around the edges of this group, and this still happens. Look at the University of Alabama and a recent controversy about sororities refusing to accept African-American students. It wasn't just racism and xenophobia and segregation, it was anti-miscegenation. And there's a long history of this form of eugenics at North American schools. So let me lay something out in plain language here. The legacy of the very structure of higher education in North America is a form of rape culture linked to eugenics. We can see this even through university architecture. Unsurprisingly, when Disney and Pixar animators wanted to create a realistically forbidding setting for the film Monsters University, they studied several real universities. The Monsters University gates were modeled after those on exclusive campuses like Berkeley and Harvard. Of course, they're onto something. Indeed, using gates as an ideological fo foci of college architecture has traditionally ensured that we will view the university as set apart from society. Ironically, the same gates were built and used in other total institutions, like asylums to forcibly keep the public out and the deviant in. College gates keep the public out and the elite in. Further, the gates urge us to understand academia as a space to protect and as a space to be secured. This means that a professor of color, such as Ursula Orr, can be subject to carding, a demand to show her papers or identification on campus. When Orr refused this request, she was physically restrained, cuffed, straddled against a pre police car, and later charged with assault. This fear of interlopers is also what led to the repeated tasering of student Mustafa 
to Tobada Banijad at a UC in a UCLA library in 2006. In Canada, as Sandy Hudson po points out, quote, it would be very difficult for you to find a university or college age black person who hasn't had some kind of experience with carding on campus. As Doyle reminds us, ID checks are all too common for black and brown students, faculty, and staff. This also leads, as Morgan Holmes has shown, to discipline in the form of campus bans for students with mental illness or psychological disabilities. In Holmes' words, there is a trajectory toward removal of students who do not fit in because they have a medical diagnosis. At the same time, crucially at the same time, schools fail to, quote, protect students from their sexual assailants on campus. In other words, in a world where sexual assault is normal, but Asperger is not, a rapist is not subject to this removal, but a student with Asperger's is. A student who has been a victim of rape can assume that their rapist will remain on campus and may need to do something as extraordinary as carrying a mattress around campus for a year in order to call attention to this, as Emma Salkowitz did at Columbia University. Yet a student of color can assume that an ordinary part of campus life will include university security question, questioning their right to be there in ways that call attention to their dif difference and may even threaten their existence. So the ongoing policing of the inside and outside of higher education ensures a state of campus insecurity that almost always plays itself out on a certain set of bodies. The campus is a, quote, private zone that must be protected from the non-affiliate from public invasion. The campus ostensibly gets walled off to protect students, but this also protects and prolongs and provides grounds for practices of surveillance and segmentation that would never be allowed in the real world. We see this as a focus of these films, which should help us to see it as a, as a focus on our own campuses. And when we, design, when we deny students access to university or we fail them, we're also cutting them from the supposedly favored gene pool. So when universities deny justice to rape victims, yet allow rapists to stay in school, they are performing a highly harmful and distressing editing. When the Stanford rapist Brock Turner is described according to his appetites and his athletic prowess, he's painted as desirable eugenic stock. When the appearance and behavior of student victims is questioned, they're discarded eugenically. In the real world, the university does not protect itself from students who are rapists. It protects itself from being sued by students who are rapists. In these films, if students are in segregated and isolated and eventually discarded, it's because they are not forcefully sexual enough. Uh, I, I could go into more detail if people have seen the this movie Monsters University, but one real uh, tangible example of this is just in the different fraternities and sororities uh, in Monsters University. Um, so you have PNK and EEK and, e -E and HSS and OK, and J-O-X and R-O-R, and they're all kind of uh, uh, suggest sounds, but also types of bodies. So the one group, the E-E-K, they kind of look like Bratz dolls, while the P-N-K kind of look like Barbie dolls, and none of them are really anatomically possible, but there's a kind of argument being made about which bodies are desirable and which ones aren't. Um, so, I think I'm talking about cartoons and I'm talking about films that are supposed to be funny. Um, but I think we need to take the film seriously. And, and if we do take them seriously, then we can see a reflection of the ways that universities keep certain types of bodies out of the gene pool, while desired bodies are kept in close proximity to one another within the walls. While rape cu culture is downplayed, actively ignored, disavowed, and suppressed on university campuses, it's overdetermined on fil in film. All Hollywood films about college life are in part machines of rape, rape culture. And this tells us something about what the public believes about universities and higher education, and something of the eugenic design of these institutions. It should also cue us to the need to actively work against this structural legacy. Thank you, and I'm gonna introduce the next speaker. Uh, Amy Morrison is a very popular professor in the Department of English, Associate Chair for Graduate Studies in the Department, author of dozens of chapters and articles and invited talks on the topic of digital life writing. And she'll be talking today about rape culture and, tw and Twitter. Thank you.